Healthy Dr. Jim Young Kim, President of the World uh, Bank Group. His Excellency Jose Miguel Insulza, Secretary General of the Organization of American States. Distinguished permanent representatives, ambassadors, permanent observers, dear friends, and distinguished guests. We would like to welcome you to the 55th lecture of the Americas titled Economic and Social Outlook of Latin America and the Caribbean. We extend our greetings to the audience that is uh, connected via webcast and also to our uh, sponsor, the University San Martin de Porres de Lima, Peru. Uh, we kindly remind our audience that interpretation is available for English and Spanish. For those of you that do not have the sets, uh, you can get them in the back. In today's event, we have the great honor to have with us Dr. Jim Young Kim, the president of the World Bank Group. We walk we want to welcome you and all uh, your delegation to the House of the Americas. Today, Dr. Kim will share his thoughts on the state of development in the region and the challenges we face in achieving economic growth, social inclusion, and also combating poverty. Obviously, all these areas and also your thoughts are of high interest to our member states and to our, our audience. But this year is particularly important and interest to the OAS because the theme for our upcoming General Assembly, which will take place in Asuncion, Paraguay, is development with social inclusion. We appreciate the presence of the Secretary General, Jose Miguel Insulza. He will uh, open this uh, lecture and deliver some brief remarks. This will be followed by a presentation by our distinguished guest, to the President of the World Bank. Subsequently, uh, the Secretary General uh, will conduct a dialogue uh, with the President of the World Bank and uh, the, uh, the audience. At the end of the lecture, uh, we want to invite all of you uh, to a small reception here in the Hall of Heroes, just outside the Hall of the Americas. Uh, without further ado, let me uh, introduce the Secretary General, Jose Miguel Insulza. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon to every to all of you. And uh, it's uh, the, the welcome to the ambassadors and permanent representatives, to our friends who follow our chair of the Americas. Uh, it's a great honor, certainly, to to receive here for our 55th, 55th lecture of the Americas the president of the World Bank, John, uh, Mr. John, Jim, Dr. Jim John King and this distinguished delegation, our friend Hassan Toulouse, the Vice President for Latin America and the Caribbean, and all, his, the, all the accompanying members of the World Bank. As you know, Dr. Kim is uh, not a stranger to our region. He speaks very good Spanish, by the way. And he, he co-founded uh, with Dr. Dr. Paul Farmer and others the Partners in Health, an NGO whose community focused health care based on local needs. and. Uh, and training community members, and that has served in several countries of our hemisphere. So he has a long experience in Peru, in Haiti, in Mexico for more than 25 years of work. Uh, as you know, Dr. Kim has been president of Dartmouth College from 2009 to 2012. He was chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School. He is therefore the first black leader whose professional, professional background is not in the political or financial sectors, but rather his largest experience has to do with health and with education. I think that the, 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 thing, the theme that we are facing today, we're discussing today, economic and social outlook of Latin America and the Caribbean, is very timely. We only had it until very recently, just two weeks ago, the conclusion of the IMF World Bank Spring Meetings. And uh, 
one of the, the, the key messages of the, of the spring meeting was, and I will quote from the documents of the World Bank, that the, uh, it is imperative not just to lift people out of extreme poverty, it is also important to make sure that in the long run they do not get stuck just above the extreme poverty line due to, to the lack of opportunities that might impede progress towards, livelihood, towards better livelihoods." End of quote. In Latin America and the Caribbean, four, and ten, or four out in ten people live in what the Financial Times dubbed last week as the, the fragile middle. Neither poor nor middle class. They earn between two and ten dollars a day and are very vulnerable to a slowdown of the world economy. And um, as we all know that the IMF announced in these spring, meet, spring meetings that Latin America and the Caribbean is expected to grow at 2.5% in 2014, which is lower certainly than last year and lower than the previous years also. Uh, of some, uh, this is of uh, concern to us because uh, some of, uh, although some of our countries have made dramatic gains in, in re reducing poverty and expanding the middle class, actually what we call a middle class is as much as large today as the poor in Latin America. The figures are more or less the same. And in spite of that, at the, at the beginning of this century, we still have several problems to, to face. And the question, which I hope we will be discussing, has to do with how, how, how can we do this if the, the, the forecast for economic growth in the region are, lo are lower than in the past decades. Uh, we have helped a lot of uh, people. I mean, the, the poverty reduction has helped expand Latin American middle class by almost 50 percent. And inevitably, that bring, this brings to the fore the issue of how are we to manage their expectations in the democratic societies that the majority of our countries have today. So although our region is proud of uh, its uh, economic success during the last years, it still has to, to, to grapple with the issue of how to achieve more inclusive societies. On this, our hemisphere does have our leadership. We have uh, the, the guidance of uh, the Social Charter of the Americas and our Democratic Charter of the Americas. And this, these are the instruments that are unique in the world. But certainly our work and our inter exchange with the development institutions, with the World Bank and all its family, is essential to our work in the next decade. So with all this, so this, this said, I welcome you again, sir, at the House of the Americas. This esta es su casa, and welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jose Miguel, for having me here. Uh, thank you all for coming. And um, uh, before starting, um, I want to start with, uh, with a confession. And uh, I know that um, uh, the, the uh, World Cup, Copa Mundial, is coming up soon. But I have to tell you, I um, uh, only have late in my life developed an appreciation for soccer or football. But to show you uh, how committed I am to the relationship between the World Bank and um, the, uh, uh, the uh, Americas, this is me um, just about ready to get smashed uh, by one of President Evo Morales's guards. Um, and uh, uh, President Morales and I um, played, uh, there, here we are, that's, that's the President Evo there on the left. Um, and uh, uh, when I went to, to visit Bolivia, uh, President Morales said, well, I'll be happy to meet with you, but you're going to have to come and play soccer with me at uh, 3,800 meters, or 14,000 feet. And so um, if any of you have not tried that, I strongly recommend that you try that at some point in your life. Uh, and after the match, I later remarked that, uh, that uh, President Evo was the best soccer-playing head of state in the world. <laughs> Uh, but then later, as I met other heads of state, they told me, no, no, I'm, I'm much better than uh, President Evo. But uh, uh, I, um, uh, I, I want to start and then um, maybe provide some, a few remarks in Spanish. Buenos días a todos. Uh, Señor Secretario de la OEA, José Miguel Insulza, distinguidos embajadores, representantes del mundo académico y el sector privado, amigas y amigos todos. 
Es un gran placer para mí estar aquí con ustedes, aceptando la amable invitación de José Miguel eh, para hablar sobre una región a la que le tengo especial cariño. Uh, no, no, no voy a hablar más de fútbol, um, aunque estamos a unas siete semanas uh, del inicio de la Copa Mundial en Brasil. En realidad creo que eh, en el fútbol a los latinoamericanos les va a ir seguramente muy bien. Por eso les hablaré hoy de otra competencia, también mundial, pero que tiene que ver con la eliminación de la pobreza y la búsqueda de una prosperidad que llegue a todos los ciudadanos de nuestro continente. He compartido, he compartido con ustedes la imagen del partido de fútbol con Evo, porque creo que encierra un simbolismo muy especial. Es quizás una muestra evidente de que entre el Banco Mundial y la región se ha abierto una era de cooperación. Y eso, como dijera Evo, sin condicionamientos. Y para el beneficio de todos aquellos que en el pasado fueron excluidos de las oportunidades creadas por el crecimiento económico de la última década. Over that past decade, Latin America and the Caribbean have made tremendous progress in, reducing, in both reducing poverty and boosting shared prosperity. Poverty has fallen by half to 12.3%. The middle class, currently 34% of the population, is growing. Meanwhile, inequality in Latin America, historically the world's highest, has fallen even as it rises in practically every other part of the globe. For the first time, the number of people in the middle class surpasses those living in poverty. In fact, on that very same trip to Bolivia, when I was trying to keep up with uh, President Evo, some of the villagers uh, who were watching us were snapping pictures on their smartphones. This was one of the remote, most remote parts of Bolivia, and even there, people have technologies that connect them to the wider world. We visited on this trip uh, the Uruchipaya, and those of you who know Bolivia well know that this is one of the most ancient uh, uh, groups who speak a language that only a few thousand are left speaking, but even in that area, uh, they have access to the internet and can speak to relatives all over the world. That lesson for me was powerful. Though excluded from economic progress and largely invisible to the rich world, the poor are very much aware of how the rich live. And with that knowledge, they're demanding more opportunities for themselves, but they're demanding opportunities especially for their children. While Latin America and the Caribbean have improved a tremendous amount in recent years, we could lose momentum un unless we maintain and deepen our focus on inclusive economic growth. Over the last two years, growth in Latin America and other developing countries has slowed as a result of rapidly changing global circumstances, including declining commodity prices and the expected tightening, uh, uh, and the expected tightening of global financial conditions. At the same time, those reductions, in inequality, those reductions in inequality that I spoke about have stagnated. In fact, inequality is rising in several large emerging markets across the world. At the same time, many in Latin America's burgeoning middle class feel that the state needs to do more to, qu to provide quality services and good governance. These impassioned citizens have told their story loudly in the streets and on social media. Ironically, governments in the region are in part victims of their own success. They've achieved a great deal in terms of fostering growth and reducing inequality, yet precisely because of this success, citizens are now asking, uh, asking for more than ever before and pressuring governments to respond. Continuing strong progress on growth and inequality requires more efforts on many fronts. To boost growth, Latin America needs to increase productivity, spur innovation, 
and adapt its productive structure to changing circumstances. This must become a national priority for all countries, independent of their political cycles and ideologies. The social gains of the last decade literally hang in the balance. I'm encouraged by leaders like Michelle Bachelet in Chile, who in spite of economic and human, and the, the economic and human impact of the recent earthquake and the uh, uh, Valparaiso tragedy, is moving forward with an ambitious reform agenda to boost shared prosperity among all Chileans. Improving logistics and infrastructure, education, and the contractual environment are critical to advancing development in the region. The World Bank's latest flagship report for Latin America, which was dedicated to entrepreneurship, stressed the need to enhance competition in a region where many industries remain sheltered. In my first visit to Haiti as World Bank Group President, I had a meeting with uh, private sector representatives. As many of you may know, I've been involved in Haiti for more than a quarter century. In that meeting, I asked these leaders of the private sector, quite directly, if they wanted to work with us in generating opportunities for everyone instead of clinging to a system of crony capitalism that only benefited the elites, and I use that word. After a couple moments of silence, they said, we will work with you. I've taken them at their word. Since then, we've been working with the Haitian government and the private sector to introduce best practices in public-private partnerships and to create opportunities for the Haitian people who've been waiting so long for them. Haiti, in fact, can find positive examples throughout Latin America of creating more economic opportunities for all. It's good news, for instance, that countries in the region have strengthened trade ties with Asia and are trying to diversify their export markets to that region. For most of the countries that make up the Pacific Alliance, exports already represent at least one-fourth of their gross, gross domestic product. For these countries, there's no turning back. In my last visit to Peru, uh, I had the chance to visit uh, firsthand the, the project that I uh, worked on in Caraballo, um, a former squatter settlement that's developed quite a bit on the northern cone of Lima, and uh, where I worked for more than 15 years to combat uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis. I met many of my former patients who are now le leading healthy, productive lives. What we learned from our experience in Caraballo was that the fight against drug-resistant tuberculosis wasn't only a medical problem. It was fundamentally a fight for social justice and economic opportunity. We treated their tuberculosis, but perhaps the thing that we did that was most helpful was we helped them find a job. The story of what's happened in Caraballo is also happening throughout Latin America, as more and more leaders in the region want to ensure that social progress remains a priority. Fiscal policy can be used to sustain and deepen the region's significant social gains. And over the last decade, Latin America has increasingly used this strategy. Between 2000 and 2011, social spending as a share of GDP rose from nearly 12% to 14.5% and public spending on education increased from 3.9% to 5%. Health spending rose from 3% to nearly 4%, according to a study of 18 countries. Similarly, the number of countries in the region with conditional cash transfer programs expanded to 18, while non-contributory pension systems blossomed throughout the region, giving millions of people the opportunity to save for the future and retire with dignity. To finance spending on conditional cash transfers, the region increased tax collection from 16 to 20 percent of GDP between 2000 and 2010. And importantly, these revenue gains came primarily from more efficient tax collection and a broadening of the tax base, rather than hiking taxes on businesses and crimping their ability to expand and create jobs. Still, these fiscal policies have had a mixed impact on inequality. Cash transfers and direct taxes, such as income tax, tend to reduce inequality. But the region's continued reliance on indirect taxation, such as value-added taxes, has undermined some of its gains in equity. The good news is that there's still room to use fiscal policy to promote a more equitable society. 
We've seen the equality of access to basic service. We've seen that the equality of access to basic goods and services has improved in recent years. Yet serious concerns remain in many countries regarding their quality, particularly in education, health, housing, and other infrastructure. Of course, there's a great deal of diversity uh, across the region in this area. As with poverty reduction, most of the progress in expanding access to basic services since 2000 has been in the Southern Cone uh, and, uh, and the Andean regions, while many Central American countries managed only small improvements. Several Caribbean nations have uh, problems of indebtedness that could hinder their ability to provide quality services to all citizens. Latin America and the Caribbean have made remarkable economic and social progress in the first decade of the 21st century. But much work remains to ensure that the economic and social progress of the last decade continues and expands. Economic and social gains support one another. Providing disadvantaged children access to a quality education raises their productive capacity and enhances social inclusion through higher employability. This in turn leads to higher growth, which provides people with still more resources to improve their quality of life. As President Dilma says, social inclusion brings more social inclusion. The era when opportunities depended on your social background, your race, uh, your gender or your country of birth is clearly coming to an end in Latin America. In partnership with Inter -American the Inter-American Family of Institutions, we'll continue supporting the region's efforts to accelerate economic and social progress in the years ahead. And I look forward to uh, hearing your questions and having a discussion. Thank you all very much. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs> Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your remarks. And uh, I will just ask the first couple of questions, and maybe later we can open it to the public, of course. One of them you already uh, took in, in your presentation. The, big, the, the thing is, I mean, the, the general view in, in, in our region is that uh, most of the growth of the countries, which was uneven, I would say that. Uh, for example, if you take the, the South American countries, at least eight or nine or ten of them grew very strongly in the past decade, and the number of, poor, of people living poverty there was very big. But in most of them, this was basically export-led growth. There was a lot of, uh, of exports, a lot of growth in, com in commodities prices and volumes, and uh, at the same time, a lot of credit, a lot of money coming into the region. Now, those two things are not going to happen exactly the same as they, as they happened in the, in, the, in, the, in the past decade during this decade. I mean, what, what would, you, would you tell governments that they can do in order to keep the gains that they have made in the social sector, in the social aspect, in order to assure that, uh, that those, uh, those that I was mentioned before, less than, less, from $3 a per day to $10 a day, will not fall back? Into a behind beneath the poverty line, if the growth of the countries is less than it was during the past decade. You know, you know um, I think it's important um, to, to step back. I was, um, I was talking uh, just last night with some friends who are, are in, um, uh, in the finance business, who actually are bankers and, and um, uh, run private equity firms. And uh, uh, it, it was in an event completely unrelated to the World Bank Group. And I began talking a little bit about the performance of developing countries, um, Africa, Latin America. And uh, they still, you know, the, despite the fact that uh, developing countries uh, made up more than 50% of the growth between the 2008 to 2013 era, they're still not 
the appreciation for how quickly, for example, Latin America rebounded, right? And I think, you know, one of the, one of the things that uh, is important is that, you know, there, there's a lot of really brilliant people, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, great understanding of how the global economy works. And I think their response after 2008 was really quite remarkable. But you're right, um, uh, going forward, there are certain issues that I think are really critical. Increasing productivity is important. And so, being you know, in the field of education, um, I've uh, uh, been having many conversations with people uh, in Latin America about what they should do in terms of um, um, moving forward and improving the quality of their education so that, for example, um, you know, you know, on a basic level, the productivity of the workers goes up. But now, many Latin American countries have to think about competing with uh, Asian countries. And so how are they going to uh, be innovators? How are they going to be able to um, uh, you know, come up with the new technologies that will uh, improve their competitiveness over time? And so thinking really hard about the quality of the educational systems. You know, we, we, what we know is that there are many, many more lawyers than engineers. In, um, in, uh, in Latin America. Now, you know, I'm a doctor, and uh, uh, doctors and lawyers have a traditional uh, 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 enmity, but that, that, that's not the point. I don't, I, I'm not saying that we have too many lawyers because I'm a doctor. Uh, but, you know, this is, a real, this is a real question. How are you going to teach science, technology, engineering, and math at a level that, frankly, is in demand in Latin America? I think that's a real question. And I think as countries move to increase the number of uh, high school graduates that go to college, I think they have to really look at this issue. You know, the country where I was born, South Korea, um, now has 80% of high school graduates going to four-year college. And one of the questions they're asking themselves is, is this not, is this, could this be not only counterproductive, uh, but potentially dangerous in the sense that they're setting expectations for this group of people that are simply not being met. And what we're seeing is that the unemployment rates are extremely high because, again, um, a vast majority, now, not, not, not the vast majority, but um, uh, uh, the vast majority of the of the students who are now going to college that were not before, that now that we've at, now we're at 80% in Korea, um, uh, are graduating without really any marketable skills because though that expansion and capacity to just just get all of these uh, young people in college have ended up not being able to provide them with the kind of education that would give them skills. So that's a really fundamental question. Many countries are tackling it. You know, infrastructure is also a real issue. I mean, the, re the levels of uh, investment in infra infrastructure are very low in Latin America compared compared to Asia and other parts of the world. And also, the cost of logistics is, you know, is a, just four times as high. So productivity is really critical. Education is critical. And I think um, uh, much more strategic and even just much more investment in infrastructure will be two of the most, I, I think, two of the most important um, priorities across Latin America. Well, thank you very much. The, the second question has to do basically with uh, with the, uh, the one issue that came up very much during the meetings of the World Bank, the Foreign the, the Monetary Fund and the World Bank two weeks ago, which was this link that suddenly was actually accepted as a real link between uh, uh, economic growth or the rate, the, the, the speed of economic growth and inequality. As Mr. Olivier Blanchard said in his speech, in his introduction to the main paper for this. Uh, for this meeting, uh, we have always had inequality as a central concern, but we have never said so clearly that inequality is not only a result of uh, lack of growth, but also it's a, 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 a one of the one of the causes of the lack of growth. How does that work, and what can you do therefore to? Uh, to, 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 to reduce inequality and make it more and make it, to make our societies more productive. Well, I, I think uh, one of the one of the most sort of straightforward ways of thinking about it is if income inequality uh, leads to inequality of opportunity, which it which it very often does, uh, then overall growth will be lower. And, um, uh, and, and for, some, for some very straightforward reasons, if you're not really drawing from your entire population, uh, you know, and making sure that all of the potential entrepreneurs, the potential extremely productive members of society have a chance to participate, your growth uh, will be lower. But also, I think uh, there's now widespread recognition that with higher levels of inequality, the sustainability of growth over a longer period, I think, is also under question. You know, uh, it's very interesting because now that we're saying, we're, we're, we're on the one hand saying 
uh, much more clearly that the evidence suggests that inequality is a drag on growth. Uh, but also I think political leaders are beginning to understand that high levels of inequality creates instability in their political systems and politicians want to be reelected. And so um, I, I think that uh, our great challenge, one of our great challenges right now is to continue to think about so what are the ways where you can have growth because you absolutely need to have economic growth. It's responsible for two-thirds of the poverty elimination uh, uh, over the last 20 years. Uh, but at the same time, you've got to think about ways that fiscal policy, that, you know, that, uh, that, that, that government policies can find ways of leveling the playing field, providing better opportunities, of, uh, of redistributing in a way that will actually lead to greater productivity. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, for us, the question we're asking ourselves all the time is we've talked about um, uh, boosting shared prosperity. So what are the ways of uh, thinking about boosting shared prosperity, even in things like how we build roads? You know, the, you know, there are all kinds of ways of thinking about it. On the one hand, for example, if you have better um, uh, bidding processes so that, uh, uh, that small and medium enterprises can bid as well on the building of infrastructure, then you can be more inclusive. Making sure that roads go into areas where poor people live, you can be more inclusive. And so we, we, there is now a demand for, which is great, a demand for advice that specifically uh, gets at this issue of uh, spurring growth by making the right kind of investments, but a different kind of growth, a growth which includes uh, uh, everybody. And, and uh, um, I, I'm very glad to hear that there is a much broader consensus around this issue of the importance of addressing inequality. Uh, we now have to step up to the challenge and really help people think about strategy that, that will get you both less inequality and robust uh, growth. Well, thank you very much. I'm tempted to go into the next, my next sure. question, but I will, I will open for questions from the, from the audience if you want to. This is the moment to participate if you want to make any questions, yes, please. Uh, over there, yes, yes. 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 Thank you. Thanks. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Mr. President and the Secretary General for the invitation and also the Department of uh, International Affairs for setting this meeting. Uh, in the first place, I'd like to ask you, uh, what's yeah, the role? Introduce yourself. Tell us who you are. Yeah. Uh, well, my name is Andres. I'm an OAS intern. Uh, well, I'd like to ask, uh, what's the role of the World Bank Group uh, in those countries that believes and label the world, the, the World Bank, uh, as uh, arm of the capitalism, or it, that it's related to the United States at a, at a certain point? What would you think that is the role of the World Bank uh, within those uh, states? And a uh, second uh, question. State, states like Bolivia, right? States like yeah. Bolivia, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and in the, um, my second question is related uh, to the uh, gold standard. As we know, the gold standard has been uh, eliminated uh, and the, the mandate that the United States had uh, to keep the gold uh, reserves in every uh, country regarding their money, uh, it's been eliminated. So my question goes, uh, how do you, will you um, do or what the region must do to uh, face the, public, the excessive public spending that they're having since they don't have to keep their gold, the, their gold reserves uh, as, a, as a standard. And it, 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 they used to do that in the Bretton Woods Convention. Thank you. So, uh, you know, one, one of the most important points that I'd like to make, um, uh, you know, when, when, uh, uh, when, uh, when I graduated from college, uh, my very first trip to uh, Washington, D.C. was to participate in a protest against the World Bank. Right? I was part... <laughs> well, I, I did the same with the OAS yes. when I was... Uh, <laughs> I was part of a group called 50 Years is Enough, and about 20 years ago, we were marching in the streets and having teach-ins um, uh, aimed at trying to convince the world that on the World Bank's 50th birthday, we're approaching our 70th birthday, that on the World Bank's 50th birthday, we should just close the institution down. Right? Now, I, I'm very glad that we lost that argument uh, at, back in those days, but let me tell you why we did it. I mean, what, in, in, in particular in my case, what I was watching uh, was what I thought was a very ideological approach to dealing with healthcare. And, and, and very specifically, I was watching how user fees and privatization um, was being used as an ideological tool to transform healthcare systems in ways that I just could see in front of me didn't make any sense. Right? And so uh, our, 
our argument was, let's not be ideological uh, and let's really focus on the, the point of this institution, which we thought was to focus on the poor. Now, I can tell you the great news about the World Bank is that I know, I know few institutions that have evolved so much over the last 20 years. They've evolved tremendously. And I think uh, the, the most striking characteristic of anyone who comes and talks to the people at the bank is that we're very evidence-driven and we're, we're, we're as non-ideological as we can be. So in other words, um, I, I made it very clear to President uh, Evo Morales that I was not there to give any prescriptions, that I was not there to set any conditions, but that I was there to work with them to help them achieve their greatest aspirations for their people. So uh, they have a very strong commitment to ending poverty in Bolivia. We share that. Uh, and also, they need to build roads, they need to improve their energy supply, they need to do all these things that we have a tremendous amount of expertise around doing. So from our perspective, uh, we will uh, work with any country in the world uh, as long as we have something to offer. And it's, it's a combination of money and expertise. And our expertise is very specific. We're not coming and giving them manuals. We're not coming and giving them studies. We're coming and, and, and really walking with them as they tackle very complex projects. Projects that you cannot complete with a list of instructions. It takes a lot of uh, experiential knowledge and, and, and know-how to get these things done. So we are uh, open to working with anyone and there are certain conditions. Um, uh, one, you know, they have to be a, a member in good standing of the IMF as well when, when, when we do so. But we're open to working with anyone. Uh, I've talked many times about the possibility of uh, eventually working in North Korea, for example, um, the country of my father's birth. And, and uh, uh, it's not the ideology, it's whether we can bring value to the table. And in terms of public spending, you know, um, I think one of the things, one of the lessons that we've learned uh, over the years at the World Bank Group is that there really isn't a co single country in the world that cannot improve its public spending. So, uh, you know, uh, the other thing that we try to do is to work very hard at encouraging countries to focus their expenditures where it's going to make a difference. Right? Um, general subsidies, for example, uh, are very popular. Fuel subsidies is, is at the top of the list. And it turns out that those general subsidies, like fuel subsidies, are very regressive. Uh, they help people who don't really need help in societies. And instead, uh, we think that people should focus their social expenditures in a, in a, in, in a way that really helps the poorest. Conditional cash transfers, uh, for example, that have been, uh, um, uh, that, that, that really were pioneered in Latin America and are now being spread all over the world. So, uh, literally, we believe that there's not a country in the world that can improve its public expenditures, and they really do need to focus on, on, on that uh, as, uh, as they go forward in order to remain competitive. Thank you very much. I'll give the floor first to the Ambassador of Dominica, and then the lady here that was the first to ask for the floor, and then we'll see how we proceed. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, President Kim. You mentioned uh, the importance of education. And usually when institutions like yours talk about education, I think they refer to basic education. Um, and I'm wondering whether we are not really in a post-basic world, a post-basic education world. Um, and, and that institutions like yours and the OAS and, and others need to be paying a lot more attention to higher education as a driver for growth and, and, and to invest in the possibility that in investing in higher education, some of the gains that you wish to have in basic education could be realized as opposed to the strategy which focuses almost entirely on investments in basic education. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And, and, and um, uh, you know, having, having come to this job uh, from running an institution of higher education, um, I couldn't agree with you more. But here, here's what we're trying to do at the World Bank Group, and, it, and it's, uh, it's, it's very important because uh, uh, I think the Millennium Development Goals were very focused on getting kids into schools. So what did we do? We built schools and we got kids into schools. But the question is, what were they learning? And uh, is getting kids into seats really so important if they're not learning anything? 
And so uh, one of the things that we've started, uh, and, and let, me, let me continue, it's not just basic education in which we have questions about what kids are learning. Those questions extend all the way through higher education. You know, I uh, used to spend uh, uh, at least two days a year, and, and usually more, but two, di two days a year, we, all of the presidents of the Ivy League institutions would meet. And we sat there and we, we would talk about, you know, are we really providing value at the end of the day? Uh, or are we pre-selecting students who are so bright that as long as we didn't kill them, they would go out and be successful anyway, right? And so the question of what value we were adding in the Ivy League was a real one. And we asked each other, do we have evidence that suggests that we're adding a lot of value, right? Now, um, uh, in universities in the United States, uh, uh, President Michael Crow at Arizona State has begun doing very rigorous tests of where his students are when they enter college and where they are when they leave. And the delta, the change, is really striking. And he's starting with a much lower um, testing group, and they're coming out with a, a lot of added value. And he has argued, even though he is a product of the Ivy League, he has argued that he is adding much more value to his students than any of the Ivy League institutions. So uh, this is where the dialogue has to evolve to. We have to now step back and say, we may, you know, we had some success in getting kids into these seats, but now we've got to step back and think about not only basic skills and learning to read and learning math, we have to think about what does it take to generate innovation among a group of people? What does it take to, to uh, build creativity? That's the question that many of the middle income countries are facing in a very real way. Um, it, you know, it seems like the OECD PISA scores, uh, the Program for International Student Assessment, those scores seem to be very closely related to economic growth. And so now we have much better measures of whether these school systems are, 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 are being successful in getting students to a point where the economies are becoming more competitive. And th that's a very difficult conversation. It, the, you know, if we in the Ivy League had trouble assessing our own record, you can imagine what it was like for you know, uh, countries in much, uh, much poorer countries. But this is the task. We've got to now be good enough at the World Bank Group to be able to say, here are the critical elements of an elementary or a basic education that actually teaches skills. Here's what a middle school and a high school and even a, a, a higher education institution should look like if you want to accomplish the critical task of increasing productivity, increasing competitiveness of your economy. Uh, over there. This microphone, please. <clears throat> I'm a little bit embarrassed to ask the question, but Who, I will. Could you okay. identify yourself, please? I have to tell you. That's okay. Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. Naomi McNally uh, with the American um, uh, Embassy in South America, but right now we are, uh, we are um, on pension. So I lived in Honduras and I lived in uh, um, Colombia uh, until 1999. And it, it was almost painful to see the uh, inequality. So I'm touching a lot on, this, on the Secretary General question. I, w I would like to hear um, specific changes. What do I mean? For example, um, I had a maid in, in Colombia, and she took um, computer classes, but she could not get a job, and she went back to doing a maid uh, job, or there was a guy in Colombia, he was so, you know, looking good, and he took care of himself, and all he had to do all day long is to open the gate, close the gate, open the gate, close the gate. So, uh, when I'm, uh, I hear here that the, there is a change in the decade uh, of this, uh, this century. I would like to know a little bit specifics. More children go to school, more, more kids have shoes so they can make it to school. Do they have money for uniforms so they won't be turned away from school and so on. I, I really would like to hear not just numbers but specifics if possible. Thank you. Well, I, let me just give you 
an example uh, very specifically from Caraballo, the, 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 the town that I worked in for many years. So when I first went there in 1994, right, um, uh, in order to make a phone call, uh, we had to drive uh, about 30 minutes into the, the city and wait in line at the one phone that was in that area. Um, it was what at the time was, it was that there's a, there's a gradation of squatter settlements and at the time it was called an asentimiento humano, which is lower than a pueblo joven. In, and uh, it, 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 was, it was extremely poor. It was supposedly the bedroom community for uh, Sendero Luminoso. There were explosions, uh, very poor social services. Now, there is better uh, 4G cellular coverage in Caraballo than there is in my home in Washington, D.C. Uh, the services have improved dramatically. Uh, people who are working in the informal sector are now working in the formal sector. The quality of the healthcare services have gotten tremendously better. And it doesn't look, in, in 20 short years, it doesn't look anything like it used to before. And I think that story is being repeated over and over again in the urban areas. But there's still a tremendous problem in the rural areas. Uh, but even so, the, the, the example I gave you about uh, you know, meeting the Uruchipaya, that was really striking. Uh, you know, they, 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 they told me that um, uh, gaining access to telephone service up in those mountains helped them tremendously, not only in being connected to their families, but in understanding what, the, what uh, grain prices were looking like on any particular day. So there is, there is uh, tremendous progress, but it's uneven, and that's the, that's the issue. How to make it more even, how to make it stretch even further. And so it's, it's, it's beyond just those basic things that you're talking about, which are critically important. What you have in Latin America is they have to not only provide these basic services, but they have to think about competing with Korea and Singapore and, and, uh, and, and, and in India and Malaysia in the future. All those things have to happen at the same time, which is why it's so challenging. Ambassador Prince, yes. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. My name is Lucilia Prince. I'm the ambassador of St. Vincent and the Grenadines to the OAS and to the USA. Ambassador from? St. Vincent, Vincent and the Grenadines, yes. Caribbean. Uh, so, Dr. Kim, I heard you mention in your speech the, you acknowledge the indebtedness of several countries of the Caribbean. Um, but uh, this indebtedness is in fact exacerbated by the policies of the World Bank and other institutions to graduate many of these countries from concessionary financing. So perhaps uh, you can tell us, if you might, about some of the policies that the bank has in considering um, other criteria other than GDP uh, so that we can probably have special and differential treatment for smaller and more vulnerable countries. Thank you. So it's, a, it's, it's an important question. Uh, uh, you know, at, at, the, at the World Bank Group, um, we, we are a collective, we are a cooperative, 188 member nations. And uh, just this morning I spent uh, three and a half hours with my board, which represent all of the 188 member nations in, dis in discussing um, our, our budgetary strategy. Now, among those 188 member nations, as you can imagine, tremendously varying views about the direction the World Bank should go. And so it's really important that we set certain rules about uh, when countries graduate. And it's, it, you know, those, are, those are exceptions that I cannot make as president. For example, um, if, uh, if a particular country is indebted but their GDP per capita is higher, can we choose to then give them more concessional loans? That, that's not a decision that's in my hands right, right now. We can't change the, the, the income uh, cutoff for IDA, which is, uh, which is our concessionary loan, uh, uh, just because countries are more indebted. Now, um, and you can imagine the argument for why we wouldn't do that, right? So if you knew that if, you, if your debt got higher, that we would then change your you know, level of, uh, of uh, your, 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 um, your interest rate, then it, you know, we talk about moral hazard and, and the problem of countries becoming more indebted. So I, I can just tell you that uh, w one of the things you can do is to ask uh, your representative uh, at the World Bank Group to raise this question. My guess is that it'll be a very difficult argument to win. We're gonna do everything we can uh, to try to help countries get on the path of growth 
and to manage their debt uh, more effectively. But there are countries that are, um, you know, facing very difficult circumstances right now, and we're 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 watching them very very closely. Uh, we we don't, you know, defaults and and uh, especially in the larger countries could have uh, very far-reaching uh, impacts across the region. We don't want that to happen. But we'll, you know, in this case, we'll take it case by case, and in in uh, situations where there's real emergencies. That's when sort of the whole board gets together and says, okay, we're going to have to do something special here. But if we do something special, it will also require the country to do something special. It will require very tough sacrifices and very tough uh, policy initiatives for the countries going forward. I, I, you know, if you want, we can talk about individual countries if you'd like, but, uh, um, uh, you know, there are some situations that are very worrisome. Uh, we need to be flexible and helping, but things like ch changing the cutoff for our concessional loans is very politically difficult. Well, we have very little time, so I'm very sorry. I have a lot of questions. Uh, people asking, uh, want to ask questions, so I'll take just two more if you sure. don't mind. Yes, here, please. On the <laughs> back over Dr. Kim, my name is Russell Jones, uh, also a lifelong educator. And uh, in terms of full disclosure, I should admit I'm an engineer because I wanted to pick up part of your answer to the Secretary General's first question, where you uh, emphasized the fact that technical education at the higher education level is what is going to allow these Latin American and Caribbean countries to compete with Southeast Asia and India and so on. Uh, how can the World Bank reach in as part of its loan strategy and make sure that that is where the funds get spent. I worked over the last several years through the OAS to uh, set up a, an organization called the Engineer for the Americas, where OAS is now the secretariat. It has not been very effective in getting the dollars spent in the right way. Can the World Bank help? You know, I certainly hope so. It's a great question. Um, there, there are some really interesting examples. For example, um, in, uh, in Peru, uh, we have uh, we provided uh, financing for a private sector university uh, that has had a really interesting impact. They, 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 it seems that uh, because they were so much more focused on using technology, uh, because they were so much more focused on using evidence-based approaches to use, for example, online education, they've actually increased the, the, the standards for universities all over Peru. And the traditional ones are, 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 are working to, to compete. And uh, uh, so I think there are many different strategies. Um, you know, I think uh, it's, it's uh, the, 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 f uh, to a great extent, um, we, we really are and have been focused on the public sector and public sector institutions, and we think that's appropriate. But I think we have to step back and look at all the different possibilities. You know, um, if you want to look at sort of uh, educational systems that are very well adapted to local markets, I mean, I think you have to look at Germany, Switzerland. You know, uh, Korea has 80% of their high school graduates going to four-year college, whereas Germany has 40%. Right? And the other 40% uh, or so are going into extremely high quality technical uh, uh, education. And some of the technical institutes are just as prestigious as the four-year institutions. Now that, that takes time, but I think that's what definitely uh, uh, Latin America has to look at. And so what we can do to help is to bring these models of approaches to engineering education, for example, that have worked in other parts of the world and, uh, and, and, and suggest these as potential strategies. I mean, I think, you know, um, uh, the very high expectations of young people who go to four-year colleges come out with a degree in literature and have no uh, uh, employment opportunities, you know, that, that, that is just a, a setup for social unrest in the future. Uh, and I think people are beginning to understand that. Uh, the gentleman back there and glasses and then the ambassador and that's it. Okay, no, sorry about that. Sorry. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, Your Excellencies. My name is Emmanuel de Valillo from Venezuela and I work for the organization as one of its interns. Um, my question is addressed at the report that the World Bank published in 2013, which is entitled Yes. Oh, sorry. Uh, which is titled uh, "Shifting Gears to Accelerate um, Shared Prosperity in Latin America and the Caribbean," and of course, this report raises a very concerning question of whether or not uh, the countries will be able to close this gap by 2013. Uh, sorry, 2030, which is the date that uh, the World Bank has set to end poverty. 
This question of closing the gap has engulfed most governments in the region to focus on solely fo um, trying to get wages to, to make that uh, threshold. But then there's also the issue of subnational inequality in which depending on the region or province in which you live, you have a very different lifestyle to the ones that do so in urban areas. Which are some of the thoughts or prospects that you and the board have with regards to these challenges? Thank you. Um, so yes, you know the, the the closing the gap issue. So there, there really, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned, there are really two major issues. One is that there has to be more growth. We we have to uh, we have to to ignite growth in uh, in in uh, uh, across the across Latin America. Um, but in terms of subnational strategies, this is a really important point uh, because one of the things that we've started doing, especially in Brazil, is uh, we've started being able to. Um, with with national guarantees, sovereign guarantee loan uh, to sub sovereigns, to you know, to individual states, individual cities, and so that's one of the things that we would like to do more of in the future to be able to focus specifically on the poorest regions. For example, in Brazil, we're very focused on the northeast uh, in terms of our um, uh, of our work. So um, uh, yes, you know, growth and inclusion, both of them together, are critical. Uh, I've talked a lot about increasing productivity, more investment and infrastructure, uh, but also I think that part of the uh, contribution of the World Bank Group could be in being much more focused on, uh, on sub-sovereign lending and focus specifically on the problems of regions inside particular countries. Yeah. Ambassador, yes. yes. Thank you. I'm Nirmala Badwissing, the ambassador of Suriname to the OAS. Um, I would like to thank you for your very um, enlightening presentation. Um, my question relates to the issue of accessibility and conditionalities of um, the IFIs. Um, you have mentioned uh, a couple of elements that are pretty important for all the countries of our region, and that is to uh, improve our productivity, to um, enable the levels of equality, and also to focus more on investments in the infrastructure. Um, my question specifically relates to um, how could there be a more effective streamlining of policies within the IFIs to make funds and expertise to countries uh, easily accessible? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's, um, uh, that, that's exactly what we're trying to do. So uh, when I came in uh, in July of 2012, um, I spent literally the first six months just walking the quarters, talking to people, and um, uh, in, in essence asking that question, you know, what can we do uh, to make it easier for, for governments and uh, private sector companies and all of our clients to work with us? Uh, how can we work more effectively and efficiently? And I walked around the institution and I asked just two questions. One was, when have you been proudest of being a World Bank employee? When were we at our very best? And the second question was, what would it take to be our very best all the time? And I got a whole bunch of answers, a whole bunch of suggestions about fundamental things that we needed to change. And so I took the staff at their word, and we, begun, we began making those changes. And we began making those changes, the staff said, wait a minute, and uh, they're saying it right now, and you're hearing a lot of noise in the press, because changes uh, of the of the, of the magnitude that we're making right now are difficult for organizations uh, to go through. But at the end of the day, here's where we'd like to be. First of all, uh, what we heard from clients and what we heard from inside the staff is it takes too long for us to get loans out the door. It takes too long for us to respond to questions. It's just too bureaucratic. So we're really working on shrinking uh, the bureaucracy. The other thing they said was, sometimes you provide very good um, advice, but we've heard that there are great innovations in Indonesia, and we don't get them in Latin America. Uh, so we've now uh, changed the structure so that all of the people working on water or health or education throughout the world are part of one group, and the um, experiences and innovations are going to be shared much more broadly across the world. Uh, the other, uh, one of the other questions, uh, of course, was, um, uh, you know, uh, you need to lend more, especially to middle-income countries. So we've increased our capacity to lend. So we're going through uh, an organizational change process specifically focused on that question. But at the end of the day, you know, the, the changes will, um, will, will fall into place on July 1st. 
But at the end of the day, uh, the criteria is whether you come back to me in a year and say, you know what, the World Bank is easier to work with, the knowledge you provide is better, uh, you're better partners for us, you're helping us think strategically about how we can compete in the global economy, and things are better. So um, we're going to continue to, uh, to change and to make small changes, course corrections, until we get to that point where all of our um, members are saying to us, wow, there's a real difference and, and this is better. Well, thank you very much. That was going to be my last question, so thanks to the ambassador. And please join me in uh, thanking uh, President, John, uh, President Kim. Uh, for his very enlightening presentation of this uh, house of the America. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.